Welcome to Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. On the show, our team of industry experts interviews contingency fee attorneys. You will discover everything from how they got started to the secrets of their success and what's working in today's marketplace. And now, here's the Case Closed Podcast. Well, we have the man, the myth, John Groth from Wisconsin. And we are going to talk to him on the Case Clothes podcast. So, John, I know yes. you do personal injury work. Uh, what would you say is the best advice you ever received uh, as an attorney? The best advice I ever received? Oh, man. I thought these were going to be easy questions. Um, I don't know if it's if it's succinct. I want to give you like a cool saying, but it wasn't just a saying. I had one. One boss, when I first got out of law school and uh, worked for a firm, and his comment was, or his advice really was about thoroughness and being thorough and really understanding a file and not taking no for an answer. And I really, you know, I think his response oftentimes when I would go to him and say, well, what about this? What about that? Well, you know, playing devil's advocate. And he would say simply, who's your client? I'd say, well, my client is my client. It's like, well, our client, therefore, you have to do whatever you can for them and believe them. So their side of the story is what we're advocating for. So you have to be as thorough as possible. Don't leave any stone unturned to truly advocate for that client. And really, I've taken that to heart where, you know, the this was quite a while ago. That was over 22 years ago. But you know, now, um, it's more commonplace to Google and go on Facebook and go on Twitter and really leave no uh, digital stone unturned for any client. I mean, just the other day we were, so I was using this advice. There was somebody who our client was involved in a crash and he, uh, him and his wife and his daughter, and uh, they were involved in a crash with a commercial vehicle. Well, the cops didn't come because the at fault party said, hey, I have some warrants out for my arrest. Um, please don't call the cops on me. And my client was too nice and did not call the cops. And now there's a, he said, he said as to how the accident happened. So we're investigating this and it turns out, you know, that the ad fault party really has a pretty uh, significant criminal history. And that's going to make a big difference that this guy, you know, is now saying that we're at fault when the truth is that he was at fault. And you can see by going online and seeing what the criminal history is for this person that um, we're right, he's not. You know, And it's a matter of being thorough, trusting your client, believing your client, and then advocating for him. Long, yeah. long answer, sorry. That's uh, long answers are great. So in uh, prepping for this, we talked about that you are uh, make a distinction between listening and hearing, and you actually hear your clients and have trained your associates to hear versus listen. Can you expand upon that for the audience? Sure. I think this is one of the many podcasts that I listen to. I listen to all these you know, podcasts and all the advice over the years and books that I've read, where your listening is just sound going in your in your ears, and you have a general idea, but really hearing is truly understanding what's going on. And then being able to digest it and then ask meaningful questions so you really understand. And it's a matter of just being there and having music in the background or enjoying a good Oliver Nelson tune where you're really involved in it. You know, So those are the two things where hearing is being involved in that music, being involved in the conversation and understanding what's being said and asking questions if you don't understand. And Listening is just being present and being in the elevator as the music turns off and on and the sound is there. Now, you have told me uh, about your family, and I think you're a great family man. So how do you imbue that into your staff and your associates so that they can have a proper uh, work-life uh, balance? Yeah, I think it's a matter of just simply being I hate to overuse the word understanding, but simply being, uh, you know, understanding where we had staff who um, 
came and said, I you know, have something going on with my kid. And my initial response is that's more important than I am, you know, period. That's more important than I am. We'll figure out the work. You know, I will do what I can to pick up whatever slack might be caused. And you have to take care of your family before you take care of me. And then hopefully they understand that I'll stay up at night and go over some file or do whatever I can. So they have that, that peace of mind uh, to take care of their family. I think it's a matter of being understanding and just being human. I think it's, I think you can be good and do good at the same time. I think that's certainly a, an achievable goal. So in our preparations, you told me about uh, many a time where you have helped people on a pro bono basis. Uh, and uh, when you do good, you get good. So tell us some of the stories about how you had successful financial uh, success in a case on starting out a case and it was a pro bono. Boy, well, I don't know if I want to say financial success. Uh, well, not necessarily for you, but yeah. for the client, right? You do good, you help, they got good. Yeah, well, and I, I think it's more of, you know, for example, there are cases that, that we've handled where there is no insurance and we've gone all the way to a judgment against the ad fault party then at that point secure their place in the world of the, you know the the financial world so the victim knows that at some point they're going to get paid something when the ad fault party gets some money or um, you can uh, garnish their bank account or things like that i mean i had a case years ago where there was a kid who was hit by a, a driver who was under the influence and in Wisconsin, I think nationally in, in bankruptcy court, if you're under the influence of drugs uh, and you're involved in a crash, you can't file for bankruptcy on that. This person didn't have any assets at the time. There were a young person who was you know, driving while under the influence of, I believe it was cocaine, and they caused us horrific injuries to my client, who was also a kid. And we went all the way. Uh, we didn't get paid anything. We went all the way to a judgment. And got a judgment for this kid. And this has to be over 10 years ago. I just talked to the to um, the victim just a few months ago again uh, about how he's doing with the understanding that you know this judgment is in place and the ad fault party is going to have that on their record and they will have to pay when they have you know a job or garnishments or uh, let's say they ever win the lottery or things like that. But you have that that peace of mind. If there's nothing else that comes of it, you have that peace of mind for, you know, for the victim. And now in Florida, you can renew a judgment up to 20 years. And then after that, it's, it's dead. What Same is thing it? here. 20 years. Yep. Okay. All right. I'm going to give you a, a, a big one here. Tell me what you think is the highest professional moment, not the family moment in your career. The highest professional moment. I think it has to be the parking lot hug. I think it has to be that that story. Well, why don't you um, tell the audience about that parking lot hug? Sure, the parking lot hug. Um, it just because it, I can still still feel the sandpaper on my face. So we had a client who is a big guy, a professional football player, um, many years ago. You know, I don't have to shave. Maybe I shave once a month because I just don't grow facial hair. This client maybe has to shave twice a day, you know, the, that kind of the exact opposite of me. So um, this is after a long day in trial, jury goes out, you know, we had an offer pre-suit that was not good. And my client went out to dinner. We're waiting for the jury to come back. I'm wandering around the courthouse because I'm nervous. I don't know what's going to happen. And I finally, the jury comes back. I call my client. He said, I'll be there in a second. Well, the jury came back almost instantaneously and the judge wanted to get home because it was late at night. Uh, and they told us the verdict before my client got there. I walk outside as my client's uh, coming into the courthouse and I meet him by his car in the parking lot. And I told him what the verdict was. And it was many tens of times more than what the verdict or what the offer was. And he was just ecstatic. 
and he grabbed me. And again, I'm about six, two ish. And he is, I don't know, six, eight or something. You're this big guy. And he grabs me and both arms and starts jumping up and down, hugging me. And my face is against his face. And it just was like, I was getting sandpaper all over my face, but it was just the best feeling because you knew all these years and gosh, I live with that case. Him and I got to know each other. Well, you know, he moved down to Arizona. I flew down there, walked through his house, met with him and his wife multiple times, and we got to know each other well. And uh, that culmination at that moment where we're in the parking lot sharing the good news and he was just relieved, happy, ecstatic. I don't know what you can say. And I don't know if those are the best emotions to describe. I guess maybe relieved is the best one. So all these years, it's finally over. There was a good result. And he was able to have the money to pay for the surgery that he needed to repair his injury. You know, so those kind of things that just so much went well. And to have him give me that kind of hug was just a, a great professional moment. Not the most money that I ever got in a verdict, but um, maybe the most satisfying. Uh, approximately how many attorneys refer to you? Refer to me? Yes, sir. Oh, gosh. Um, or have you tried their cases? Which yeah, I'm, I'm uh, it would be dozens. Well, um, for, for the folks out there, uh, that is proof that John knows his uh, game. When another ref attorney refers a client, they're putting themselves at malpractice risk for negligent referral if, if John wasn't good. Uh, so to have uh, in a, a state the size of Wisconsin to have 20, 30 attorneys referring to you is a testament that John knows his stuff. In Other the parking lot hug case, that was a referral from another attorney that I met at a conference in Vegas. Um, and he referred that case to me. And since then, we probably talk, that attorney and I now have become friends. And we talk uh, probably at least once or twice a year just about business stuff. So, yeah, yeah and referrals, it, it's the greatest compliment, certainly. Well, the last question uh, that I'd like to ask you is, other than your wife and God, to what do you attribute your success? Um, other than my wife? Other than, maybe I should say God first, then my wife? Well, I know, um, I'm not I'm putting your, your wife in the category of God. That's how okay. you right. a, a smart husband. Honestly, I would have to say, and this might be a common answer, but probably my parents and going back to probably you know, watching my parents work and my father, you know, my father had at any time four jobs. You know, he was a Milwaukee fireman. And as a Milwaukee fireman, you work 24 hours and you're off two days. So work 24 off 48. Uh, and for those 48 hours, he didn't stop. He worked for a welding company. He repaired welding machines. He was a handyman, um, built houses, he had a wood, uh, firewood kind of business, you know, all these different side hustles, I'll say now, back then it was just an, another job. And just seeing that it just, he didn't stop. That's kind of where I think I attribute my success that I was thinking about this last night, you know, I don't know when I'm going to stop if I'm able to stop, really, right? I mean, I could be 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old, hopefully, knock on wood, and I think I'll still be doing stuff, maybe not as much, but I'll still be active, because um, I just don't know if, if my brain's going to know any, any difference. Well, for those out there, this is the type of man you want to have close your case. So thank you for being on the Case Closed podcast. And hire Mr. Groff. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you for listening to another episode of Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and their insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast is led by industry experts who unlock insights from the nation's top contingency fee attorneys. Each week on the show, the guests share how they got started, secrets of their success, and what's working in today's marketplace. Guests on the Case Closed podcast include successful contingency fee attorneys that will share their secrets so you can close more cases. Tune in each week for a dynamic conversation about winning legal strategies that will grow your business. 